I think they're not being controlled. Uh, I agree with you. They don't know that they're being controlled. It feels totally voluntary while you're in it. And I'm glad you brought that up. It reminds me of something um, a friend of mine a long time ago said, Peggy. Um, she put it very well. She said, when you're in a cult, you, you may have some doubts, but you put them on the shelf. You see or you hear things that eh, just don't sound right or, but nah, you put them on the shelf. And as you go along in the cult, the shelf gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And then finally something happens and the whole shelf collapses. And that's when you leave, when the doubts can no longer be d denied, when you can't rationalize them. Because I think in a cult, people do have a divided mind. A piece of them might be aware that this is stupid, this is garbage, this can't be true. And the other part of their mind says, shut up. This is real. I believe the guru. I believe what's happening is for my own best. And, and, and actually in a, in, a, in a group, in a cult, you're taught to distrust your own mind. You're told that what gets in the way of enlightenment or gets between you and God is your own ego. So you're taught to distrust your own thoughts. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, yeah. So go ahead. Well, for someone who's been a seeker, uh, and then they come upon a group where, where the leader seems to have the answers, um, it's easy to buy into the belief of mm -hmm. distrusting your own thoughts because you're so far in your life, your thoughts haven't taken you anyplace. That's right. Yeah. And they're going to show you the way. And, you, and, and the other thing is, the more time, the more money you have invested in a group, the harder it is to listen to your own thoughts. You have committed a piece of yourself you may have stood up to family and friends who said you were nuts. You have put yourself on the line. And to admit you're wrong is really tough, even to yourself. On the topic of thoughts, what is meant by the phrase thought stopping? Well, I think that's part of the teaching of don't trust your own mind. And then when you have negative thoughts, you're, you're taught to counter them with something the group teaches you to think. So you actually learn how to turn out that small part of your mind, that observing ego that says, oh, come on, wake up, wake up. You're taught how to not to listen to your own self. And there's certainly enough um, slogans or um, words that one could use that reinforce group teachings. Um, trust, love, love of guru, um, your mantras, whatever, whatever the group teaches you. Um, in fact, in some groups, there's a shepherding in the sense that you're assigned someone who will help you along the way, and negative thoughts are reported to that person. And that person <laughs> is your monitor. So, you, so in many groups, there's an outside monitor of your own thoughts. In some groups, and I'm not mentioning, purposely not mentioning names of groups, um, there is a very formal monitoring of your thoughts. You're, you're expected to undergo testing or, or um, um, confession, which is then dealt with, sometimes severely. A lot of groups say that the reason it's so important to control your thinking is because you create your own reality based on your thoughts. Mm -hmm. What's your response to that? Oh, that's a very common large group awareness training type of, of thing where, you know, um, if everything is your fault, everything is your responsibility, that makes you pretty helpless to the group. For instance, if um, you have, you've been brought up in a, in a in a household where you're abused, um, you can't blame anybody else but yourself because you put yourself there. They'll even say that you created or chose your parents. So therefore, everything is your fault. And that just puts you further behind the eight ball. How can you win with that one? 
Um, anything that's bad that happens to you is your fault. What's good is because the guru or the group helped you. So whatever is bad happens, it's your fault. Whatever is good, it's because of the group. And you become very dependent upon the group. So the concept of you create your own reality is a way for the group to put you down. And control you, yes. Make you yeah. feel small and unimportant. Right. And a failure. We can't control our reality. I, that would be really nice. In fact, that's one of the attractions of a group. Because life is unexpected. Bad things do happen to good people. Wars happen. Tornadoes happen. Life is not guaranteed. There's nothing guaranteed in life. So one of the, the um, lures of a group is, is control. I can remember in one group, um, I had very little anxiety or fear because I felt the leader was just going to take care of me. What a nice feeling. And in fact, when that person got sick, it was because he took all my karma. Wasn't that nice of him? It was so good. I felt bad because he's sick because of me, but, you know, you know, I felt, I did things, I did sports, I, I was active in, uh, in a lot of activities that probably I would have been too timid about, but I had no fear because I was being taken care of. That's a big comfort. You don't get that in life otherwise. So um, there are a lot of draws to be in a cult if you believe that could be. So how does a group leader convince a member that they are going to take care of them. You don't, they don't ever convince you. That's very, very subtle in the teachings. Not the, the draw on recruitment is you come in and here and I'll take care of you. No, 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 no. That's a subtle teaching of the group. Um, it may be as simple as the guru becomes ill and, and another member says, oh, he, took, he was with so-and-so, and they meditated together, and he took on his illness. Ah, so that would be an example of a group member projecting onto the leader. Yes, and they're taught to do that. Um, projection is an interesting psychological concept. We project onto others our hopes and our fears. With, when, when you meet your leader, and, well, not everybody, by the way, is in a group where they ever meet their leader, maybe through videos or speeches or lectures, or through other people who higher up in the group who pass on the teachings. But we project onto others those hopes and fears that we want them to. It's a mutuality. And um, it's, it's a part of, the, we, we project all the time onto people. When we, when we meet someone new, we evaluate, we judge. Um, it's part of our safety to to evaluate our life as we as you know as things happen. So joining a group can kind of be like falling in love with someone. You you imagine that the cult leader is going to be all these things and more. Ah uh, yes, yes, and that's why it's so easy for them to exploit. Um, what when I was doing active uh, work with ex members at workshops, I mean there'd be a large number of women in particular who are sexually exploited as well as financially exploited by their gurus. Um, the key is power and the allure of being a cult leader is the allure of having such ultimate power over people. And in some cults, the power of life and death, such as in Heaven's Gate or in um, the Jonestown Massacre. That's ultimate power. And what about, uh, back to sexuality, some groups, uh, sex is forbidden, other groups, uh, you should use your sexual energy mm -hmm. uh, to develop your mental prowess, mm -hmm. other groups, the cult leader wants to have sex with the members. Right, it's different depending upon the, the kinks or the idiosyncrasies of the cult leader, how it's used, but the important word is power. The key word is power. And sex is just another means of power. It's not personal. It's not a matter of love. Though the, 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 uh, the member may believe it's a matter of love. But it's, it's an issue of power and control. 
And it's a very powerful way of controlling memories as well, either celibacy or sexual acting out. It also controls their families because not everybody in a, in a group, in a cult, um, is single. Many of them have families and members outside of the group as well. And this is another way of controlling. Um, the primary relationship has to be with the cult, not with the family. And so therefore, very frequently, there are divorces and people uh, split up when one member of the family becomes involved in a cult. Or sometimes the whole family is in the cult and, and the children are raised in the cult. And how does that affect children later in their lives? Pretty confusing because they are brought up with the beliefs of the group and the leader which are at variance with the rest of society. So when they leave the group, um, they, have a, they have many issues to confront about what's real, what's not real, about how they were brought up versus the rest of society. How would someone born into a cult go about helping themselves once they've left the group? The same way other people do. Hopefully get, it, hopefully, um, get involved in organizations that help ex-members, and there are a number of them. Uh, there, is, there are a lot of resources available for people coming out of cults, including uh, adults who were brought up in groups as well. And again, knowledge is the key point. Um, there's a lot of anger coming out of a group, and this needs to be dealt with as well. There's a carrot and a stick type of phenomenon going on. Yanya would say that, my co-author. Um, the carrot is what it is that you were told you would have when you joined, the goal, the ideal, the stick, is what keeps you in line. So as long as the carrot is not too far ahead of you, and this, well, the stick can be pretty abusive in some cults, um, that keeps you going. There has to be some kind of goal, even if it's just closeness to the leader. The goal is to be free of something or to gain something or to correct something. It could be a political cult. They're talking about mind control and suicide bombers. How do you get all these young people to willingly strap on explosives? There has to be a goal. There has to be a rationale and some pretty good types of control to enlist that kind of individual. So the, so the cults can be quite extreme from joining God, attaining heaven. I mean, they both can be idolistic, whether it's a suicide type of deal or um, what seems very benign, becoming God. Uh, there has to be enough reward in order to make it worthwhile for that person to be there. Because if it was all negative, then it's a real possibility they'd leave. And some people are thrown out of cults for whatever reason. And that could be pretty upsetting to think that um, you're not worthy of being in a group. I've counseled people who've been thrown out of their cults, and it was devastating because they felt they lost their only opportunity for salvation or for enlightenment. Lots of ways of people leaving. They could walk out, they could be thrown out, the leader can die, they could be exit counseled out. What is exit counseling? Exit counseling is when typically the family will hire experts whose, whose job it is to know that group inside and out, know how that group controls the individual, and talk to the member, and hopefully clarify for them um, how they're being controlled so that they'll see it and want to leave. Does exit counseling work? Mm -hmm. Very frequently it does work. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes uh, I've been on teams, and usually it's, well, it could be from one to three or four people on a team who will talk to the member 
And um, first they have to overcome a lot of resistance. And um, usually if the person listens for a day or two, the light dawns and they really um, start to question the beliefs of the groups enough to leave. Sometimes they'll come in and they won't listen or um, they'll walk away because these are not any kind of situations ex in exit counseling that require restraint. There's no restraint. People can leave. It's simply voluntary. And if the member agrees to listen and spend time with, with, the, with the team, then very frequently they will leave. But if a person is in a group by virtue of hypnotic suggestion given by the cult leader, how can an exit counselor overcome that? Well, you can overcome it by education. I mean, trance states don't last. It's not like someone has control of your mind forever. Trance states, one, can wear off, and two, once you understand what happened, the bubble bursts. Once you understand what was done, how it was done, why it was done, what the effect of it was on you, it no longer has control over you. And what about those people who say that they can hear their leader talking in their mind? What happens in, 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 uh, as part of the group suggestion is that, in, in some groups anyway, the, the, the guru resides inside of you. And the belief is that they know your thoughts, they know how you feel, uh, they know what you're going to do, um, there's no secrets from the guru. And once you believe that, then you believe that the guru really does know what you're thinking. And um, so it's, it's really typical, especially if you've listened to tapes and you've, sat, you've, you've been in, in group meditation or meditation with your leader. I mean, you've heard, heard him or her over and over and over again, so no wonder you're going to hear it in your head. But also, sometimes the group leader will say things, they'll make comments about you personally, mm -hmm. that they must, they must have access to some kind of supernatural knowledge to know those things about you. People are not aware of how easy it is to read them by someone who's trained to read them. And, and cult leaders are very good at reading people. Very good. And there's a, um, they're very good at winnowing out, too, who's going to cause them trouble and who's going to be a good follower. And they'll get rid of people who might be trouble. What would you say to people who dream about their leaders? Inter they're interacting with them in their dreams. The leaders are telling them what to do, and they think that that's real? Well... As a therapist, I've heard all kinds of dreams. I've had people tell me they dreamt about the death of their parent or the death of a child, and they were very scared about that. And, that, and when they talked about that, I would say things like, are you worried about so-and-so and so-and-so? Or how you would feel if this happened? Or We'd find the reason for the dream. It wouldn't be predictive. In fact, I've never, ever almost 30 years of being a therapist, ever heard of a dream being predictive of those sorts. So if, if you're in a group and your leader says, I'm always with you, and at night we will take trips into the astral zones or wherever, then there is a hope that you're going to have a dream like that. That's, not, that's human nature. If you go to sleep thinking, I'm hoping I'm going to have a dream about so-and-so, Invariably, you will. Just as people who've been traumatized, um, I'm thinking of people with post-traumatic stress disorder who actually had severe trauma, they have difficulty sleeping because before they go to sleep at night, they're worried they're going to have a nightmare. And you know what? If you go to sleep at night worrying you're going to have a nightmare, odds are you're going to have a nightmare because we do dream about what we think about before going to sleep. Is post-traumatic stress disorder a problem for former group members? That's an interesting point. In order to be diagnosed with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, one must have had first a trauma 
that left you with, with terror, with feeling hopeless or helpless and terrorized. Now, the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistic Manual, wouldn't consider uh, spiritual death or fear of a guru as meeting that criteria probably, but for those of us who left cults, could be and felt that way. Um, the diagnosis for PTSD would be one you have to have be in an experience where you witness something or you experience something that was life-threatening or f left you with feelings of terror and helplessness. And then there has to be re-experiencing of that through intrusive thoughts, dreams, memories, being triggered by sight, sound, smells. Um, another part of PTSD is trying to avoid thoughts and feelings, memories, um, exposure to anything that resembles the traumatic experience. Um, there may be traumatic re-experiencing, flashbacks, intrusive thoughts, which one tries then to avoid. And um, usually there's sleep difficulties, irritability, uh, difficulties with memory and confusion as well. And this lasts for several months. So then what kind of character does the ideal group member have? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I couldn't even begin to say that. It depends on the group. Because they're antisocial groups. Some, some, um, some gangs might be cult-like in, 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 their, in their makeup, in which case you'd want a whole group of sociopaths together. You know, so you, there's no ideal. And how is it that a practical down-to-earth person gets involved in a group? There's no uh, barrier to that. All you need is a desire. If you have a desire that matches what's promised, then that's all you need. We all have desires for something. And you can go throughout your life without ever finding someone who has that perfect thing for you. But once there's a match made, then it becomes a hard thing to... Um, walk away from. Especially in the beginning, it doesn't seem like there's much commitment demanded upon one. One never sees the extreme commitment that's needed to be a good cult member. And what becomes of people who end up spending their entire life in a group? No, well, there's certainly a, a large number of them. I can only imagine. Um, it depends on how controlling the group is, actually. In some groups, the guru uh, claims that they can teach their followers how to heal themselves, mm -hmm. or they might have healing instruments that can, they can use to heal themselves. Uh -huh. And as these people grow older and get sick, and... Uh, What's well, got to be there for? They did something wrong. Otherwise, they wouldn't have gotten sick and died. It's obviously your fault. You didn't follow directions, you didn't meditate long enough, you ate the wrong things, you had coffee. I mean, whatever it is, you had bad thoughts. It's never, ever the group's fault. And there are some groups that promise freedom from death. So it's, it's pretty amazing um, how they keep their membership that loyal. So in a group that promises immortality, when the person dies, then that would be the ultimate failure? Of that person? Yes. Yes, absolutely. That they didn't follow the rules of the group sufficiently? Yeah. They didn't leave the life. They, they, they had bad thinking. Who knows? It's never the leader's fault. People don't necessarily look bad. These people are destroyers. They're not just interested in control or money or sex, or whatever. They 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 don't care if they destroy the person they exploit. And that is very hard to acknowledge for a good person, 
very hard to acknowledge that there are people who are downright evil.